No, it's always nice for us to see a new, a new face. And uh, Mayuko um, here is uh, a new face, and um, I'm hoping she will become a, a regular face, but this is her first time at the conference and her first time of addressing the conference. Um, <clears throat> Mayuko originally comes from Osaka in Japan. She studied Japanese literature and linguistics and worked for a while as a stockbroker. And she came to the UK in 1994. <laughs> well, yes, good point. And, and did a, an MA in Applied Linguistics at Sheffield, where she met her husband, who's also with us today. And she now works as a, a translator. So her special, again, um, specializing in the financial sector. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I, um, uh, as people will know, I have some uh, Japanese connections as a result of um, translations um, that the, a translation that was done of a book that I had written into Japanese uh, by a Japanese lady who at the time I didn't know, but is now a very good friend of mine. So um, she, I was very taken by how she and her friends, her circle of friends were all very, very knowledgeable about <coughs> English literature and, and even knew Barbara Pym and had read some of her books either in translation or even in English. So I asked them if they would be able to recommend anyone who could talk about the um, similarities and contrasts between a, a Japanese woman's life and a, a typical Pym character's life. And they suggested Mayuko Akiyama. And so uh, I would like you to really give her the traditional warm Barbara Pym welcome. Thank you, Deb. So hi, everyone. I am Mayuko Akiyama. I'm delighted to be here finally. And I'm from Japan originally. The theme of this conference is Barbara around the world. So I'm going to talk about how relevant famous novels are in modern day Japan. So I would like to give you a bit of my background to manage your expectations. <laughs> I am no expert in this literary world, but I love books. I grew up reading many English children's books such as Alice in Wonderland, The Chronicle of Narnia, Swallows and Amazons, Peter Rabbit, and The Lord of the Rings. Then of course, as an adult, I love Jane Austen, The Bronte Sisters, Anit Bruckner, among others. I studied linguistics in Japan. After university, I worked in the financial industry for a while, but my dream was to come to England to experience the lives in the children's books I led, sailing in the lakes and looking for Peter Rabbit. <laughs> so I decided to uh, come to England and study for an MA in applied linguistics linguistics at Sheffield, where I met my husband. He's sitting over there. <laughs> and I found a job at the publisher in Glasgow and helped to compile the Japanese English pocket dictionary by Langenscheid, just there. And since then, I have been working as a translator interpreter, mainly in the financial industry. Now back to Barbara Pym. I was introduced to Pim's books recently by a friend of Deb here, and I have become a big fan of her books. Thanks to COVID-19, while my usual activities were on hold, I was able to read 12 of her books and enjoy them immensely. So today I'm going to talk about Barbara Pym's world and modern Japan. You can see the difference. <laughs> you might wonder if there are any common elements between Pym's world and modern day Japan. Yes, there are plenty.
So some of PIM's books are translated into Japanese and available to purchase from Amazon and others, such as Excellent Women and Culture in Autumn, Samten Gazelle, and A Grass, grass of Blessing. Can you see them? <laughs> And some of the books, including excellent women, are described as masterpiece of Ohitori-sama, in English, self-partnered or solo life novels. As you might know, Japan is one of the most advanced aging societies. Japan's Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication predicted that the rate of single-person household Hold, will reach 40% in 2040. Therefore, Ohisori-sama, or self-partner life, is one of the dominant themes in Japan. I am very confident that Japanese leaders can easily recognize Pim's character in themselves. Actually, Pim's world may be becoming increasingly relevant to Japanese and global readers. Due to the pandemic, physical activities such as traveling and visiting places and friends living far away were restricted. But we have rediscovered the importance of local friends and communities. We also have an increased appreciation of using our imagination, which comes from reading and take us to other worlds without even budging from the sofa. During lockdown, I noticed that some of Pim's books are selected for comfort readings. So um, a British writer, writer um, Nina Stipp listed Pim's novel as one of her comfort reads. So it said, Ali Barbara Pim for times of trouble. And Pim's excellent women was ranked number five for the Times is the best funny books to cheer you up now last November. And moreover, I believe that the recently published The Adventures of Miss Barbara Pims by Paula Van renewed interest in Pim. I bought this book at my local branch of Waterstones, and one of the staff's recommendations was attached to the book. I also enjoyed the audiobook version of this by BBC Sounds. In the introduction, for the reissued Excellent Women, Alexander McCall Smith described Pim's novel as poros. Pim's novels are about as far away as it is possible from engagement with the great political and social issues. They are powerful reminders of the fact that one of the great and proper concerns of literature is that motley cluster of small concerns that makes up our day-to-day -day lives. This is what gives her novel their permanent appeal. I totally agree with him. It is very enjoyable to read about ordinary lives with a bit of wit. This makes one smile and feel good about oneself. When you have a good book, you are not alone anymore. Your imagination will take you to the world of that book, and we can forget about politics and pandemic for a while. Mm -hmm. Today, I have picked one of the most popular modern Japanese books called Convenience to Women by Sayaka Murata to compare with Pim's excellent women to demonstrate how Pim's books are relevant in modern day Japan. <laughs> The stories of these two books center around the protagonists who are single women in their 30s. Countless books and TV dramas are about spinsters, often focusing on how they are being marginalized in society or detailing their hunt for a future husband. 
the film Bridget Jones' Diary and the TV drama Sex and City were big hits in Japan. But Japanese audience also appreciate a more nuanced, subtle or realistic version of such stories. I believe that convenience to women and excellent women are good example of this. So Convenience to a Woman was published in 2016 and won one of the highest book awards in Japan. It was translated into about 30 foreign languages and sold more than 1 million copies. The author Sayaka Murata was born in 1979 in Japan, only one year overlap with Pim's life. Aside from working as a writer, Murata worked at a convenience store three times a week. Basing her novel on her experiences, I believe that Barbara Pym used her experiences at the International African Institute for her novels too. Here's a short summary of the story. That protagonist Keiko is not normal. People find her odd and her family worries about her not fitting in. She is 36 years old, single and working at the convenience store, and she's very good at her job there. But she tries to fit into society, quit her job, and start living with a man she met at work in order to please her family. However, she becomes very unhappy. And in the end, she realizes that her happiness comes from working for the convenience store at which she excels and not from fitting in with society, getting married and having kids or having a good job. Barbara Pym's novels go very well with such storylines. Her character seeks more happiness rather than a husband. In her novel, the spinster may not necessarily find a husband by the conclusion. For instance, the character of Mildred in Excellent Women and Prudence in Jane and Prudence but they are leading a happy life without a husband, going on dates and doing well at work, being helpful or seeing friends, for instance. Reading these stories makes you chuckle, and I believe that these small pleasures are so precious in the stressful social network that modern society. These stories are good reminders that not all people have fabulous lives, but they can still be happy. So moving on to excellent women. I believe that many of you have read this book, but just to be sure, here's a summary of the story. The main character, Mildred, is over 30 and married working at the Society for Aged Gentlewomen, and she's also helping out the pastor Julian at her local Anglican church. Her life is turned upside down when the new neighbor Helena and Loki move into her building. Their marriage seems to be on the rocks. Although she has a soft spot for Loki, she tries to remain neutral. In addition, her good friend Julian and Winifred is lives also take a significant time. Julian falls in love with the new tenant, a widow, Allegra Gray. Mildred feels a tinge of jealousy. However, having seen the turbulent nature of the marriage of Helena and Loki and the breakup of Julian's engagement, Mildred begins to believe that a woman does not have to marry to have a full life. Can you see some similarity between these stories? So here's a list of similarities I found between these two novels. Number one, both are com comedies focusing on small communities, Anglican church and convenience store. But I have to say that convenience store woman is a bit of a black comedy. <laughs> and number two, uh, that protagonist is a single female, as a um, single female, Mildred and Keiko. They are both leading contented lives, but feels that they might be missing out something. 
both stories are told in first person narration by the protagonist. Number three, the main male characters are selfish, somewhat unlikable, <laughs> Loki and Shiraha, and they are exploiting the protagonist. Following their appearances, the protagonist's lives are turned upside down. Number four, the last one. There is a quiet resistance against social norms. For instance, questioning the definition of happiness or being normal. I would like to take a look at these key similarities in more detail, focusing on the female characters. So the story in Excellent Women develops around the life of Mildred, mainly in the small community around her, including her churches and neighborhood. No significant events take place in the story, but a series of small amusing love related incidents happen. Most of the characters in this novel are ordinary with some flaws. As for the convenience store woman, the story is built around Keiko's life as a convenience store worker. In Japan, convenience stores serve a bit like a small community. They offer extensive products in addition to food and household goods. Cosmetics, medicines, magazines, books, toys, and concert tickets are on sale. They also provide a variety of services, including certain local government services, parcel pickups, charity outlet, de delivery service for the elderly, and more. Some stores, including a cafe where you can enjoy a coffee, beer, or something from the deli. There are some people who go to convenience store at night to dispel their loneliness. Many convenience stores operate around the clock. It sounds a bit like a church in the past, doesn't it? Workers there are not considered very worthy, just ordinary people. So these are the photos of convenience stores in Japan. Keiko is surrounded by friends and families who try to make her fit into society by getting a husband or boyfriend. And both stories include many comedic moments. I feel that these backdrops for the stories are very similar, centering around small communities. So moving on to the most important theme for today, spinster characters. Pim's key theme repeated in her novels is the lives of spinsters such as Mildred in Excellent Women, Prudence in Jane and Prudence, Letty and Marcia in Caute in Autumn, Miss Morrow in Crampton Hodnet, and Kathleen in Less Than Angels. This is an important theme in modern Japan too. So unmarried rates for women in Japan in 2015-30 survey were fairly high at 34.6% for 30 to 34 years old, and 23.9% for 35 to 39 years old. And oh, and 19.3% for 40 to 44 years old. However, literal progress has been made with regard to the social stigma against unmarried women. During the bubble era, um, 1980s, women were referred to as Christmas cake. Let me explain, Japanese Christmas cakes are typically fresh and should be consumed within a couple of days, and just like this. And this means that they are best on the 24th of December. 24 is also the prime age for marriage. Christmas cake is past its best after the 25th. Likewise, women who are over 25. 
However, nowadays the saying has shifted from Christmas cake to toshikoshi soba, a bit brown. <laughs> and um, these are special noodles that Japanese people eat on New Year's Eve to remove the bad luck they suffered during the year that is ending. Nobody wants to eat these noodles once into the new year. The implication is that women should get married by the age of 31. Social pressure for marriage remains high in Japan. So in fact, uh, the 2015 survey um, revealed that 89.3% of unmarried women aged 18 to 34 years old intended to marry at some point. Only 8% never planned to marry. The reasons behind desire to marry include having a family, having a family, uh, uh, sorry, um, having a family uh, and children or fulfilling parents' wishes and achieving a better financial position. I'd like to take a closer look into Japanese women are uh, actually like. It was somewhat shocking news that Japanese ranked 120th among 156 countries in the gender gap ranking in 2021. This is by World Economic Forum Survey. The UK ranked 23rd, and it was in the last place among the major advanced economies. So you can see Scandinavian countries um, highly ranked, and Japan is surrounded by developing countries. So low female representation in the Japanese cabinet and parliament were cited along with representation in business. Only 15% of senior and leadership positions are held by women. But uh, in the area of education and health, however, the gender gap in the country has been mostly eliminated. In other words, they are well educated and in good health, but are generally not so su successful in their careers maybe spending their lives carrying out dull office jobs. This sounds remarkably similar to the character in Pym's novels. Maybe they are just like Mildred in Excellent Women, who is very capable and is able to resolve any small crisis situation for her friends and neighbors. She seems to find pleasures in being helpful. Firstly, I would also like to go back in history to find out what Japanese women were like and how they came to be in this situation. Japan's first queen was thought to be called Hemiko, AD 242 to 248. Since the current imperial system began, there have been eight female emperors out of total of 126. Although the number is low, female royal family could get to the top of the country until 1889, when the Imperial House Act was introduced to prohibit a female heir to become emperor. This was made into law in 1947. Actually, the current government is debating to see whether a female heir should be able to become emperor. It sounds like a very outdated discussion but it is still a reality in Japan. Secondly, I would like to look at female in literature. Japan has a very long tradition of good female writers. One of the most famous female writer is Murasaki Shikibu. Wikipedia entry details the following. Lady Murasaki, around 973 to 1014, was a Japanese novelist, poet, and lady-in-waiting at the imperial court. She is best known as the author of The Tale of Genji, about a very good womanizer. 
that widely considered to be the world's first novel um, written in between about 1000 and 1012. Um, this is the one. And the next one. And Seisho Nagon lived in the same era as Murasaki Shikibu. Their library was well known. Shonabo became popular through the, her book, The Pillow Book, a collection of gossip, poetry, observations, and complaints written during her years in the court. Shonagon's essays de describe the various daily experiences and customs of the time and affairs of the imperial court in Kyoto, where she lived, from a unique point of view. This sounds like Pem, doesn't it? And there are also many internationally famous modern Japanese female writers. Here are some of my favorite. They are all available in English versions. So the first one I talked about, and then um, Professor and Housewife by Yoko Ogawa. Strange Weather in Tokyo by Hiromi Kawakami, Kitchen by Banana Yoshimoto, and um, Out by Natsuo Kirino, and Breast and Eggs by Meiko Kawakami. Thirdly, I would like, also like to look at other globally known Japanese women. So one of the greatest Japanese women I would like to introduce here is, of course, Umeko Tsuda, who has a strong connection with this courage, I believe. Umeko Tsuda, 1864 to 1929, founded Tsuda College, one of the oldest women's colleges in Japan. She was the first Japanese woman to study in the United States at the Japanese government expense. <laughs> As you know, she also studied here at St. Hilda's. Her experience in the United States enabled her to be a pioneer of women's higher education in Japan. She is well known as a great educator. Additionally, she is one of the few Japanese philanthropists of her era to focus on enlightening women and improving their status through education. As you can see in this slide, this one, and her face will be on the new Japanese 5,000 yen notes um, from 2024. I picked this photo as I wanted to express how important she was for modernization of Japan after the end of national isolation in 1868. One of the criteria for the selection of banknote is the person we are proud of as a nation. Actually, I found the plaque commemorating her um, um, like, uh, um, by the wall um, by my lodge here just over there. And in the artist category, I would like to introduce Yayoi Kusama. You can see her work at Tate Modern right now She's an avant-garde artist. She was highly influential in the 1960s New York, but only recently hit the mainstream due to the popularity of her walking installation and musical public sculpture. And there is Yoko Ono. I'm sure you are all familiar with this artist and peace activist who was married to uh, John Lennon of the Beatles. In the science category, astronaut and cardiovascular surgeon Chiaki Mukai became the first Japanese woman to go into space in 1994. The first British woman, Helen Sherman, went in um, 1991, so she's there. Um, now maybe it is time to go back to the books. As I previously mentioned, social stigma for unmarried women still remains. Here are a few quotations from these books describing not so young single women. Regrettably, there's a little difference found in the description of spinsters between 1952 and 2016. 
They are often viewed as miserable, hopeless, and useless as they, as they have empty lives. However, the characters in these stories are actually busy and happy or content in their own way. Let's take a look at excellent women. The first one, I suppose an only unmarried woman just over 30. There is no hope for her. And there's not much you can do when you are over 30. Most important of all, we had neither of us married. That was really it. It was the ring on the left hand that people at the old girls' reunion looked for. It's not natural for a woman to live alone without a husband. I don't know whether spinsters are really more inquisitive than married women. So I believe they are thought to be because of the emptiness of their lives. And moving on to convenience the woman. You are still in a dead end job at your age and nobody going to marry an old maid like you now. She's only 36 years old. But a married Mickey whispered to me, we are the only ones here who can't hold our heads up high, aren't we? Mickey is one of Keiko's school friends who has a good career but remains unmarried. Very similar sort as above when Dora and Mildred got together. So um, I think these were very, very similar what they're saying. And I know that it was considered weird for some of my age to not have either a proper job or be married. Again, she's just only 36 years old. And here was everyone taking it for granted that I must be miserable when I wasn't. But she was thought to be miserable because she's not married. In short, Shingu women are hopeless, weird, and miserable, have empty lives. So I looked into the views on men in this novel too. The quotation from both authors have something in common. General expectation on men are that they shouldn't be required to do trivial work such as housework, but they should get married and earn their living properly. Actually, my dad was an excellent cook and did house chores, and so does my husband. <laughs> Both the main male character seems to be unconventional in some way. Interestingly, neither of the authors include a stereotypical good cat, good cat types such as Mark Darcy in Bridget Jones' diary in their novels. Their description of the character is rather unkind or even ruthless sometimes. Having said that, initially the female characters show great interest in them despite their flaws. However, they are not women waiting for a month so that their, their lives can start, such as in Pride and Prejudice or Sex and the City. They get on with their life without men. So in Excellent Women, Loki seems to do most of the housework or delegate it to Mildred. And Helena is busy with her work and some of the character criticizes Helena. Loki is also a womanizer and somewhat selfish. Loki does not seem to do much job-wise. In Convenience to Woman, the main male character is Shiraha, who is single and has no proper job. He's hunting a rich wife so that he does not have to work. He seems to feel that there is an unfair expectation on men to get a job and more money. That's right. He came to Keiko's convenience store to work, but he was fired shortly afterwards. He is portrayed as a lazy, useless, and selfish person. Again, we can find similarities in the depiction of male characters. They are slightly unconventional and their emergencies turn the protagonist's lives upside down. 
Here are some quotations from these books. Uh, first, the excellent from excellent women. Surely wives shouldn't be too busy to cook for their husbands. So referring to the fact that Loki does most of the cooking. And, but it isn't natural for a man not to be married. This is about Julian. And you don't think that men should help is the housework? I ask. The last paragraph um, describes Loki's character very well. People used to fall in love with him, but it only lasted about a month or two usually. After that, one saw what a shallow kind of person he really was. He used to take people up for a week or two and then drop them. We men officers used to call ourselves the praisings. Sometimes we are taken off our shelf and dusted and looked at, but then we were always put back again. And moving on to convenience to women. Uh, this is a scene Keiko told Shiraha, the main male character, to tidy up shelves at the convenience store they are working for. He said, this sort of work isn't suited to men. This type of work is more suited to the way women's brains are set up. And Shiraha complains about society being tough on men. If you are not yet a free fledged member of society, then it's get a job. And if you've got a job, it's earn more money. And if you earn more money, it's get married and have offspring. So society is continually judging us. And the, the last one shows Shiraha's character very well. I want to spend my whole life doing nothing for my whole life until I die. I want to just breathe without anyone interfering in my life. That's all I wish for. So in summary, in general, men should get married and not be required to do trivial jobs. But the male characters here are unconventional. Loki cooks and appears charming, but he's shallow and womanizer. Shiraha is single with no proper job and selfish. So lastly, moving on to the last key similarities. So quiet, quiet resistance against social norms, questioning the definition of happiness or being normal. Interestingly, in both stories, the main characters show quiet resistance to marriage and question the definition of happiness. Funnily enough, there's a literal mention of love in the marriage. Marriage seems to be viewed as a duty or practical solution to fit into society. It also stressed that marriage isn't everything. So uh, from excellent women, these quotations are all fairly negative on marriage. All these delightful men married to such monsters, such fiends. <laughs> And the next one, William, Mildred's friend, Dora's brother is talking to Mildred. You mustn't marry, he was saying indignantly. Life is disturbing enough as it is without these alarming suggestions. I always think of you as being so very balanced and sensible. Such an excellent woman. I do hope you are not thinking of getting married. And the next one, Dora and Mildred talking. There's not much you can do when you are over 30. She went on complacently. You get too set in your ways, really. Besides, marriage isn't everything. And it was not the excellent women who got married, but people like Allegra Gray, who was no good at sewing, and Helen Napier, who left all the washing up. <laughs> And moving on to convenience to women. Again, um, generally negative comments on society in general. Anyway, nothing changed since the Stone Age. And this is a dysfunctional society. And since it's defective, I am 
treated unfairly. And I found society just as annoying as he did, but there wasn't anything about myself that I particularly wanted to defend. And marriage is viewed as a practical solution. So she said, getting married will at least remove the risk of people sticking their noses into your love life and sexual history, won't it? And marriage is a matter of paperwork. Overall, they are fairly negative on marriage and society. The lives of these protagonists are shaken a little by social pressure and men. They show disappointment and the lack of self-esteem and desire for change at one point from excellent women. But I have never been very much given to falling in love and have often felt sorry that I have so far missed, out, missed not only the experience of marriage, but the perhaps even greater and more ennobling one of having loved and lost. I haven't been married, so perhaps that's one source of happiness or unhappiness removed straight away. So moving on to convenience store woman, Keiko feels she's bullied as she's unmarried. These past two weeks, I'd been asked 14 times why I wasn't married and 12 times why I was still working part-time. So for now, I decided what to eliminate from my life according to what I was asked about most often, I thought. And then Keiko is thinking about marrying Shiraha, the main male character. Deep down, I wanted some kind of change. Any change, whether good or bad, would be better than the state of impasse I was in now. You can see that they feel that they're missing out something. They like a change. However, in the end, they realize that their lives are not so bad. So Mildred and Keiko are content and settled in their own ways at the beginning of the stories, even though they are not living amazing lives. After the emergence of the main male characters, their confidence is somewhat diminished and their lives seem unfulfilled. We just looked at this in the previous slide. However, soon they get back to their usual selves, regardless of what the others think about them. I'd like to point out that they are not trying to persuade others to feel the same or to demand changes in society. They are just quietly showing resistance by remaining what they are and casting the question, what is happiness or what is normal? So um, from the excellent women, the first quotation shows that Mildred leads a good quiet life. I went into my little kitchen and laid my breakfast. I usually left the house at the quarter to nine in the morning and worked for my gentle women until lunchtime. After that, I was free, but I always seemed to find plenty to do. I, as, I, as I moved about the kitchen, getting out china and cutlery, I saw not for the first time how pleasant it was to be living alone. After various happening, Mildred comes to the conclusion that single women can have a full life. You could consider marrying an excellent woman, I asked in amazement, but they are not for marrying, he said, smiling. They had certainly not occurred to me and I was to find myself embarrassed. Therefore being unmarried, I said. And by that, I mean a positive rather than a negative state. And this is the last phrase, I think. Um, he might need to be protected from the women who are going to live in his house. This is about Julian. So what was my duty there and the work I was going to do for Everard? It seemed as if I might be going to have what Helena called a full life after all. And moving on to convenience to women. 
The next two quotations reveal how Keiko feels happy for the first time by being part of society, following finding a job as a convenience store worker. So for Keiko, being normal is very important. At that moment, for the first time ever, I felt I'd become a part in the machine of society. I'd been reborn, I thought. That day, I actually became a normal cog in society. When the morning comes, once again, I'm a convenience store worker at Cogwin Society. This is the only way I can be a normal person. And then she got together with Shira had to be more normal, but she realized that this makes her very unhappy. Therefore, she decides to split up with him and goes back to being a store worker to be happy again. So here goes, I can't go with you. I can't betray my instinct. It probably is convenient to have you alone, Shiraha, to keep my family and friends off my back. But the animal me, the convenience store worker, has absolutely no use for you whatsoever. <laughs> and the last one. For the first time, I could think of the me in the window as a being with meaning. So Keiko felt very happy as she thought about being back at work in the convenience store. In summary, initially the protagonists lead quiet but contented lives. However, their lives are shaken both by the main male character and by society. Eventually, they come to realize that their lives are good. Conclusion. As I discussed earlier, I found that these two novels show remarkable similarities. It is a bit of a shame to see that the views on society haven't changed much between Pym's generation in the UK and modern day Japan. These two protagonists are very resilient, quietly powerful. Their lives are shaken a little by social pressure and men for a while, but both get back up on their feet quickly and show the world that they are content with who they are regardless of the views of society. <coughs> Both these two writers achieved universal appeal by portraying human hearts in a small society with intimacy and in such a comical manner. I would love to see more Pim's books on the shelves of Japanese bookshops for this reason. I hope that Pim's books become bestsellers soon in Japan too. I hope that you enjoyed my talk. Thank you very much for listening. I think, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we've got time for a couple of questions before lunchtime if um, Mayuka is willing to answer questions. Would you like to come and, and sit down to answer them? Yeah. It might be more comfortable. <clears throat> right, who's first with a question? I'm sure somebody must be. Yes, Michael, do you feel you need a mic? Because there are some roving mics here. Might be a good idea. Uh, you... Would you like to come down and get a mic? And then you can <laughs> and then you can take charge of the roving mic after that. I just uh, as we all know, uh, the church played <clears throat> an enormous role in Barbara's life. I must admit to being very ignorant of uh, what religion, if any, uh, is uh, in Japan, but is there any sort of uh, religious organization in Japan that has uh, an appeal to uh, the single Japanese woman? <laughs> Actually, Japan is very different, and obviously we have religion, and. Well, national religion is that like Shintoism and Buddhism, but uh, we are not really religious people, but we got to shrine every new year 
and then we said we married in um, shrine and then we buried in Buddhism. But uh, they're not really offering community at the moment. I think it used to be, but and obviously we have Christian as, as well, but uh, it's a small amount. So basically we don't really have churches sort of, you know, alternatives um, in Japan. I think probably it used to be Buddhism and temples offering some sort, but not anymore. Anybody else? Sure, there must be someone down here. If you want to hand the mic to the mic, Mike, Michael, Michael, the mic. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. I enjoyed it. I was interested in Convenience Store Woman and would like to know which of those two books uh, of excellent women on Convenience Store Women you read first and what connected you and how did you get the connection between the two? Um, I read Convenience Store Woman e years ago and then when I was trying to find the angle of um, Barbara Pym and um, yeah, Japan, and just came to my mind, um, or maybe this might work. And then I wasn't really sure. So I um, talked to my friend who's very knowledgeable about Japan and here and his English. And he's actually studied New College in Ox um, Oxford, New mm -hmm. College. Anyway, and he suggested exactly the same thing. So I should compare excellent women with um, convenience women. So I was quite convinced should work. And that's how, how we came about um, um, to compare those two because both single women's lives. And as I said, convenience that becoming a bit like um, churches is a bit different institution. However, people come to convenience to and trying to meet people, not talking to, but just to see people. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes, Beverly. Um, oh, it's all right. And, oh, thanks, Lucia, thank you. I enjoyed the talk so much. Did I hear you say at one point that you think that um, convenience store has kind of a dark side to mm -hmm. it? Could you explain a little bit about that? So as a character is not like Mildred and she's not really a nice person. There's a, there's a scene that um, there's a little bird um, was in the park and sort of died. And she said to um, the father she was with and said, oh, you can do like a teriyaki bar because you like teriyaki. So that sort of, uh, she's a bit strange. And also another scene, she, she was at the classroom and, and some sort of um, fight broke out. And then somebody said, oh, you have to stop this fight. And then she just sort of lifted the skirt up and then and everyone went quiet. So that, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, so she's not normal. I mean, that sense abnormal. It's not like, um, not just she's single. So she just wanted to be normal. Pretty harsh there when she was getting rid of that boyfriend. She says, I don't Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I don't she, think Mildred would have put it quite that way. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so she's a bit sort of, well, a black sheep, I guess. And, hmm. Did she, could we? Thank you very much. That was um, absolutely fascinating. Um, and I wanted to ask a bit more about the sort of the some of the similarities and interests in British and, and sort of Japanese sort of 
culture and, and literature because I know in the UK we um I think many of us have a sort of a certain view of Japan and mm -hmm. you know I'm writing today with my Muji pens and I'm always in Wagamama mm -hmm. and um you know we sort of have that sort of view of things but we don't really read a lot of literature or anything in translation in this country I think we're quite insular in that respect so I'm definitely going to uh, buy a um, convenience store woman because it sounds fascinating but what my question is about is about about, um, you mentioned that in Japan, you know, books, um, you know, by uh, British authors are really popular and people read them in translation and you know, your friends are often read them as well in English, you know, presumably they've got quite good English language skills. But um, is there more of an interest in sort of um, historic English culture or more contemporary English culture? So, um, you know, is it, is it just a slightly sort of nostalgic and historic, you know, with the sort of Barbara Pym and the Brontes and things, or, or is there a lot of interest in reading current British writers? I think both, but maybe more sort of um, historic one, because I was kind of quite surprised because it's not uh, the original version, but uh, we have to read Shakespeare not in English, but in Japanese, and we all know about all the stories. And then I talked to my friends and they said they never read it. So it's, and also Dickens, and and also I mentioned about children's books. I read a lot of um, English children's books and all kind of came um, probably after the war or during the war as well. And so we always interested in English books, but also, maybe somebody like um, Kazuo Isiguro, um, he's sort of light in parallel world of Japan and Britain. So we are interested in British culture in general. Um, yeah, I think it's both way, but more towards historic. And some are very subtle. That's what we like about, I think, is American. Well, we love America as well, I think, but uh, <laughs> a bit too much for us. So, <laughs> yeah, we are in Ireland kind of similar way. So we prefer sort of more nuanced um, stories. And that's what we like about British culture, I think. Excellent. I, I, I think um, we've had a really interesting morning. Obviously, there's a lot more to come this afternoon. Um, lunch should be ready by now in the pavilion. I expect we'll have the same big queue we had last night. So um, we're, we need to be back here by two o'clock because the, the first speaker of the afternoon will be on Zoom. So we don't want to keep him waiting. So if people could come straight in here when they come back from lunch, that would be great. And thank you again. Thank you very much. Now I can enjoy it.